This is the Military Bottom Line Podcast, episode 62. I kind of thought it was like too good to be true just because <laughs> when you're active duty, like you don't really yeah. care or know much about that whole side, but mm -hmm. it's a great resource and a great program for, you know, transitioning veterans. Welcome to the Military Bottom Line Podcast where we learn from veterans and those currently serving how to make the most out of a military contract. We're here to motivate, inspire, and help you leverage your service to positively impact you professionally, personally, and financially during your military career and beyond. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another podcast episode. This is your host, Jason Birds. I don't think I've ever actually introduced myself like that, um, but for those of you that don't know who I am. My name is Jason Birds, and I created this podcast like a year ago. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm excited to all of you who are listening regularly and the new ones. I'm thankful for you guys tuning in. I'm like sweating down here. It's summertime up in New England, and it's hot, and we don't do central air, central air up here, so it's pretty. It's been a brutal, <laughs> brutal episode, uh, but I've been super fortunate and super blessed to connect with Sean McDonald who is a former Marine and uh, a Navy, rather a Naval Academy graduate. Uh, Sean did nine years in the Marine Corps with a nice little bonus of the IMA on his way out, which I'm a huge advocate for, which we talk about uh, during the show and how to make the most out of that IRR opportunity. So definitely listen in to him on that, learn about the IMA, because I don't think it exists for all the branches. Uh, I could be wrong, but I know it is a very real and great opportunity in the Marine Corps. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Sean's now been out for a little bit and building his own business as he and his wife kind of figure out their next stages of life. So he's got a lot of good lessons, a lot to learn from, and I know I enjoyed hearing his story a lot. So enjoy this episode. What's going on, Sean? How you doing, man? Good, good, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude, I'm excited to hear your story. We've been uh, connected through Mike and Shelby, and I know uh, you've done some time in the military. And now you're you're out pursuing your own entrepreneurial efforts. Um, and you know, I'd love to kind of hear from the beginning of your story of how, when, and why you joined the military in the first place. Yeah, man, absolutely. I'm excited to share. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me and uh, for everything that you've done with this podcast to just help, um, you know, educate people and give back a little bit to the veteran community. And yeah, just my story. So um, I grew up in a Navy family. I was a Navy brat. So a lot of history in the Navy, my dad, both my grandfathers. And so um, through high school, I guess I kind of went through like a rebellious stage where I like didn't want to follow in the same path. But um, yeah, in my senior year, I got, you know, kind of I woke up a little bit and decided that, you know, I thought the military would be a decent option for me. So I applied uh, to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and got in there. And that's where I went to college. And then, yeah, I had a, you know, service commitment after that. Um, but yeah, that's gotcha. how I kind of got into it initially. No kidding. All right. So, I mean, you say you were rebellious during high school, but like not too rebellious to not get into the Naval Academy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was more so like I wasn't wanting to just follow in, you know, my father's footsteps or something. Yeah. But my, I mean, my parents are great. Like I'm, I have a great relationship with them, but you know how it is growing up and you oh, kind of want to sure. like forge your own path. And, yeah. but yeah, so I was fortunate. I got waitlisted. I didn't find out till, that I got into the Naval mm -hmm. Academy until like a month before I had to show up. So wow. I wasn't a shoe in. I think I was like <laughs> on the border, but yeah, okay. I was fortunate enough to get in. All right, right on. So, I mean, you were at that point, you knew like, all right, I don't want to go the traditional route of college. I'm, you know, the military is kind of on my mind now. Was there something specifically you were hoping to get out of the military when you decided to go that route? You know, that's a great question. And thinking back, I got to say, not really like, mm. like most guys, you know, I played sports, I wanted to, you know, test myself and, you know, see if I had what it takes. You know, I, I watched all the movies, you know, <laughs> and um, kind of bought into 
you know, the cool military guy and the lifestyle and stuff. And so I definitely wanted to, you know, test myself and push myself and see if I could make it. Um, but I think more so than that, it was just like, I, I'm not sure I had a good plan for Mm. what else I would want to do. You know, I grew up in a pretty structured household. And so I knew if I went to, you know, college, like a normal college, I probably would waver for a little bit and maybe party too hard or just not be as focused as I should be. Um, so I, I thought the Naval Academy and the kind of military structure that provides would be good for me. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, so four years at the Academy Mm -hmm. and what, I mean, did you major in anything that like assisted with your military career or anything you're doing now or how'd you pick your major? Yeah, Yeah, not at all. I (laughs) haven't thought about my major since I graduated. So, um, yeah, I wonder how common that is, but I ended up choosing my major because it was one of the more laid back and one of the easier majors at the Naval Academy. And, um, so I, I was the oceanography major and, it was kind of like viewed at like they called it brochonography because it was kind of <laughs> chill. Like the instructors were pretty cool. Yeah. It wasn't super intense. Like a lot of the engineering ones. Yeah. Um, so I really like kind of just used the Naval Academy. I mean, I definitely learned a lot and developed a lot there, mm-hmm. but I was just in it to graduate and get a commission. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oceanography. I, I would envision like that's where, the dudes that want to go commission the Navy and end up in Hawaii and like just surf. <laughs> like Exactly. Yeah. Lots of surfers, lots of, yeah. you know, lots but, of the athletes that, you know, needed a little bit of a easier <laughs> workload, but yeah, it was uh, fun. Did, which branch did you ultimately switch, uh, decide on when you, when you came <laughs> to that split fork in the road and had to decide between the Navy commission or the Marine Corps commission, which one did you choose and why? So I ended up choosing to go into the Marine Corps. Um, There's a couple of reasons. I I wish it was like a better reason than this, but I didn't perform super well academically at the Naval Academy. So how when you when they assign you like what branch you serve in and, you know, what job you'll get when you graduate, it's all based off your kind of lineal standing in the class. And the biggest Mm. factor in that is the academic. So, I mean, I, you know, passed and stuff, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting straight A's or anything. So when I kind of, you know, did a little bit of a study and I was like, all right, well, here's how many numbers there are for all these jobs. Uh, I knew the Marine Corps didn't look quite as more or quite as much at the grades vice, mm-hmm. like, you know, leadership potential or maybe the physical scores or stuff like that. So um, I, in my mind, I viewed it as either like going to the Marine Corps or being on like a ship. And yeah. I spent some time on a ship nothing against the people who love that, <laughs> but it just was not for me. So yeah, yeah I yeah. decided to go in the Marine Corps. Totally get it. Yeah. And so I, you know, I being in the Marine, uh, Marine myself, I understand that, you know, similarly how every enlisted Marine is like quote unquote, a rifleman, every, every Marine Corps officer goes in as an infantry officer as kind of their baseline. Uh, did you, I mean, from what I understand, you ultimately ended up as an infantry officer. Is that something you selected and opted for, or is that just kind of how the, the cards fell. Yeah, no, I, I worked hard for that. And I, um, yeah, that's something I wanted when I went to the basic school. So like you were saying, all Marine officers go to a six month course in Quantico, Virginia, whether you're going to fly planes, push papers, move trucks, or, you know, fight rifle platoons. So, um, yeah, but I, I wanted to be in the infantry. It was pretty clear when I got there, like the infantry officers in my mind were just, you know, a, a step above a lot of the other, you know, MOSs or jobs. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was, you know, the Marine Corps is pretty clear that, you know, everyone exists to support the infantry. And this sounds a little prideful in me <laughs> saying it, but you know, I wanted the reality to reality of it. Yeah. I wanted to be, you know, with those guys and yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what I decided to do. Right on. Okay. Uh, so what did your, what did your time in look like? I mean, where did you get stationed? Mm-hmm. deployments kind of like how did the marine corps use you while you were in 
Yeah. So big picture, I did seven years active duty and two years in the reserves. So my first duty station after the schooling, I was in Southern California at Camp Pendleton with 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. I did two deployments there, one to Australia, which was pretty sick. And then a deployment on a ship, basically. We were in Southeast Asia mm-hmm. region. And then after that, I uh, got a job on the East Coast, where I am now in North Carolina at Camp Lejeune. We call it a B-billet. Basically, it's like a non-deployable unit at the School of Infantry. So, um, yeah, I did three years here before I transitioned to the reserves. Okay, right on. So, yeah, explain that a little bit, because I don't think we've ever actually discussed what a B-billet is. And I know they vary, you know, between the branches, what they call it. Um, But in the Marine Corps, like, kind of explain, like, what a B-billet is, how often that happens, and what's the point of it. Yeah, the point's kind of... The point initially, I think, (laughs) was to give, you know, the service members a break from being in the operational forces where Mm -hmm. you're basically on a, you know, year long training, six month deployment cycle over and over again. Obviously, that gets exhausting because you're away from your family for so long. Mm -hmm. So a B billet, the Navy calls it a shore tour, but it's basically a job where you can you're not deployable usually. And, you know, it's kind of a way to, you're either with a schoolhouse or a training command or recruiting duty or some other jobs, you know, are more strenuous than others. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a non-deployable billet where ideally you're, you know, getting some time back and, you know, spending some time with the family a little bit more and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, in theory, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In execution, it might be different, but yeah, it really I, depends. I know for enlisted, it's like you get to pick between like recruiting combat instructor, MSG, and like maybe something else. I can't remember, mm-hmm. but uh, for you, what were your choices when it came time to do that? Be billet? Yeah, really. Um, you know, I didn't have too many choices. It was, it was, there was a couple of spots open at this schoolhouse that I ended up going to the school of infantry. It's a pretty large Mm -hmm. unit. Um, and then there was one, you know, random billets at different schools across the country, like one in Bridgeport, California. And then there's a couple of billets with the fast companies, but those are, again, those deploy. So it's not, you know, a real B billet. And Yeah. yeah, I was always kind of, I think I always in my mind, you know, knew I wanted to do another job, but use that second job as a way to kind of set the conditions for, you know, what I really wanted to do in life. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. So then in the first four years of like operational fleet Marine forces, you deployed twice. Is that correct? Twice. Yeah. Twice. Both like around the six month time frame for deployments. Yep. Um, what like, I mean, you know, we've mentioned it a couple of times how, I think when civilians think of deployments, they think of like going to Iraq or Afghanistan. And they, when they hear like, oh, I went to Australia, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. like I, thought, I thought people vacationed in Australia. <laughs> uh, so like, you know, I guess explain the the differences in deployments. I mean, you went on a ship for a bit. You mm-hmm. went to Australia. Um, how does that work as far like do those still count as deployments? So like, how does that yeah. work? That's uh, a great question. Yeah. I guess they do still count as deployment. So (laughs) I forget what the rules are, but if you leave like the continental United States region for a certain amount of time, you know, you're considered to be forward deployed. I forget what it is like two or like three weeks or a month or something. But um, yeah, this one to Australia was pretty interesting. And there is higher level, like strategic implications of us being there. Um, for me just being, you know, infantry platoon commander, just worrying about like my 40 dudes, like it was really just a training deployment for us, Mm -hmm. but collaterally we were, you know, instructed to like build relationships with the Australian army. So we were training alongside them, sharing some of our like tactics, sharing just, you know, how we do things. And then, yeah, that, that turned into, you know, a continuous deployment for future Marine units. So Mm -hmm. people are still going to Australia, um, for six months at a time to train there. And it's just, yeah, it's a way to like strategically position forces from like a big picture level. Um, but yeah, 
it was a pretty strange experience for deployment to be honest mm. but yeah 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 cool. uh, how did that compare to i mean like australia like you could get there you just stay there basically you train for six months mm-hmm. and then you go home uh compared to you know the muse the marine expeditionary units where you're where you're on a ship for the majority of that time uh what was your preference between those two and kind of like what were the dynamic differences there yeah i guess the my preference um it really you know that's a great question i think in terms of the importance and the kind of feeling that you were like actually doing something <laughs> the mu yeah, yeah. was better because there was actually conti- we were like a contingency force so mm. you know thankfully nothing popped off or you know happened where we had to go and you know fight somewhere but yeah. it was cool to like feel like you were a part of that that mm. you know you were ready to go and it was kind of like yeah, everyone took it a little more seriously. I think when we went to Australia, you know, they told us like, Oh, well you might go like, you know, to the middle East or something, but we all knew we were like, no man, like we're here (laughs) for six months. Like we're not going anywhere. Um, it was a blast. And I think like I had way more fun on that deployment, but I guess mentally the, the Mew was a little more like serious, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, that's funny. I was just thinking about the <laughs> think about the stories of uh, I've never been on a Mew and I've never been to Australia. And uh, I, just, I was just thinking about the stories of people telling like talking about how like the Australian women are all are very fond of uh, American service members and like throwing tennis balls with their numbers on the ship kind of thing. I don't know if that's a myth, legendary or what that is, but uh, yeah, we were in so. We definitely didn't experience that. I mean, you know, <laughs> Marines, you're a Marine, like oh, yeah, yeah. Marines will get into trouble wherever we go. But <laughs> the, we were in Darwin, Australia, which is mm. kind of, it's similar to like the deep South in the United States. Like, gotcha. yeah, there's not a <laughs> lot of people. I mean, it's like kind of super hot and swampy. It wasn't yeah. like Sydney, Australia gotcha. or something where there is like a bunch of, where it's like yeah, LA people. basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so on a Mew, I mean, you're primarily on a ship um, and you're like going in and out of ports around the world kind of thing. So you, you get, there's good opportunity for seeing sites at that point or um, what, what's that like? Yeah. So um, normally the Mews will stop at several different ports throughout kind of mm-hmm. the cycle. Um and yeah, usually I have a couple of days at each spot to, you know, refuel the ship and have some liberty and stuff. So yeah, we got to go, we were in Japan and then we went to Korea and then the Philippines. Um, so we got to, you know, go to some yeah. pretty cool spots and yeah, it was, it was a pretty good experience. Like, you know, you never joining the military, you know, they say like, Oh, you're going to go see the world, you know? And part of it's like, okay, like, I guess, but a lot of the times, like, it's not the great parts of the world that you're seeing, but I was definitely very fortunate and I'm very thankful that I did get to go to, you know, some pretty cool spots and, you know, that I probably will never go back to, but Mm -hmm. it was pretty, pretty awesome. It's funny. My, my friends that have been on Muse, like the stories you hear are all Liberty stories. (laughs) So it sounds like they were on one long vacation (laughs) and we all know that's, you know, that's not the case. (laughs) Uh, but like, you know, as far as percentage of fun versus work on that for you, what do you, what do you feel like it was? I would say it was probably 20% fun, 20% work and 60% like boredom <laughs> like sitting <laughs> on the ship and working yeah. out twice a day yeah. and hanging out and watching movies. Cause there's just like yeah. only so much you can do, you yeah. know, we were, we we're trying to train and do what we can to keep, you know, our units engaged and stuff. But yeah, there's, there's really only so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. For a, uh, a Marine Corps infantry officer, like there's no job for you on the boat. No. <laughs> so as you're <laughs> sailing from one port to the next, it's like just, go down below and like stay out of the way kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we had a fun time though. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So then w- when it came time, I mean, you, cause you had a seven year obligation, right? After the service Academy. 
So it's a five year obligation. I I did just an additional, you know, two years. Okay. Um because that's what you know my orders were for when I when I PCS to um the East Coast. Gotcha. So you accepted the B billet, which mm-hmm. came with an additional two years? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And what did you did you accept that because are you from North Carolina? I, I may have missed that earlier. No, you I you know, I I grew up up and down the East Coast, but I you know, originally, I guess I went to high school and okay. college in Annapolis, Maryland. So that's where I like call home. But gotcha. okay. um, yes. So then why? I mean, I'm just curious, like when you were, got to that point of you like you could get out, <laughs> like which you ultimately did, or you can extend for two years. I mean, how did you make that decision to extend for two years? Were you not sold on the idea of getting out yet at that point? Yeah, I really didn't have a great plan in place. So I, I think in the back of my mind, I knew like I would probably get out after this next job, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I had no idea what I wanted to do, to be honest. Um, I was dating my, you know, uh, then girlfriend, now my wife. And, you know, we just didn't really know what the future was going to hold. So in order to provide some more stability and I guess some breathing room, um, yeah, I took this other job and I mean, I, it wasn't like I didn't lo- like being in the Marine Corps or anything. Like yeah. I, I loved my time in and I look back on it very fondly, you know, but yeah, I just didn't really know what I wanted to do next. So, yeah. Gotcha. So another two years, kind of buy yourself some time and use that two years to formulate some kind of plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I hear you. So then, I mean, how, because I, you know, transitions for pretty much everybody um, can go a lot of different ways. And so like this, typically it's like pretty difficult, you know, that's kind of the mm-hmm. uh, expectation stereotype. And so, I mean, if you had those two years where you're starting to think like, okay, like I got to start formulating a plan how did you use that time before actually getting out to to prepare for that exit yeah so i when i moved to north carolina i purchased a house with my va loan Mm -hmm. had no idea what i was doing super ignorant about the process i just (laughs) was like smart enough to know that you know I did some basic math on some calculator online and was like oh if i buy a house like my mortgage payment is going to be Mm -hmm. similar enough to my rent. And I, you know, understood that I would actually own something. So I purchased the house. And then when I was working at the school of infantry, you know, my commutes were like 30 minutes every day. So Mm -hmm. driving to and from work, I got really into podcasts. I got engaged to my wife and, um, kind of started to think, you know, okay, how am I going to, you know, lead this family now? And, um, got into a little bit of personal finance and just researching, you know, like grown up things, I'll, I'll say, <laughs> and just found this podcast called bigger pockets, which is like a real estate investing podcast. Mm-hmm. And it's really like a real estate investing social network online. If you go to biggerpockets.com, but one of their biggest, um, kind of outputs is the, is this podcast. And so yeah. just got obsessed with real estate and investing in real estate um, so I kind of spent the next like two years, um, Christina, my wife and I did like learning how to analyze properties and we purchased a couple of investment properties. We got into a few like short term rentals and then, yeah, kind of learned that process, figured out it was something that was pretty cool and very doable. And at that point, after we achieved some level of success in real estate, you know, it gave me the peace of mind and comfort to know like, all right, like, I think I can do this full time. You know, it's never easy to get out and give up, you know, a steady paycheck. Um, But yeah, that's how I kind of went through that process. So gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So you, you found, you know, this business, this industry of real estate investing. And so you had you know, your time of active duty left to kind of start buying properties and investing. Mm -hmm. How many properties or rental units or whatever, however you want to classify it, did you have upon exit? So we had four properties when, when I got out. And I I also will note that my wife is still active duty. So we still have the stability of like her, you know, income and and her, 
yeah, benefits and yeah. stuff, which is like, it's huge. Cause it's, you know, just another kind of safety backstop for Mm -hmm. me getting this real estate thing going. But when I got out, we had four properties. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's significant and have like, you know, leaving like number one stressor of leaving the military is like leaving that sense of security, like Mm -hmm. especially for, you know, high school graduates, college graduates that know nothing else (laughs) than like the security that is the military uh it yeah it's a it's a very daunting and like overwhelming thing to like what like why would i give this up even mm-hmm. even if you might like hate it at times <laughs> yeah so. absolutely um so then you i'm I'm curious like how you accumulated those units four units in two years i mean mm-hmm. you had already used the va loan what what how, like to some people like buying four houses in two years is like wait what how's that work yeah yeah, so we um we got pretty creative with it. We so we owned my the house I purchased with my VA loan. Once we learned how to analyze properties and stuff, we decided we wanted to do like a house hacking strategy, which I know you do with your duplex. Yeah. Um, but basically, for your listeners, house hacking is when you purchase a property to live in as your primary residence, but also rent out to generate income. So it has to be either like you know, a house where you rent out the rooms or a duplex like you're doing, Jason, where you live in one unit and rent out the other. Or what we did is we found a house that had like a separate in-law suite. So we live close to the beach here in Surf City, North Carolina. And uh, we found a house that has like a main three bed, two bath section, and then a separate little studio apartment. So we used my wife's VA loan, purchased Mm -hmm. that house with like a low down payment. And then you know, lived in the main house and rented out the guest suite on Airbnb. And I'll never forget like, you know, the epiphany I had when we had our first guest come and stay with us. Cause we didn't Airbnb, like it was kind of getting, catching some steam, but this was back in 2017. So it was still, you know, not nearly as popular as it was today. And there weren't a ton in our area. So we were like, mm-hmm. all right, like, I hope this works. But mm-hmm. we had this lady come stay with us and she booked for like three nights. And then, you know, the night she we were so excited and the night she before she was supposed to check out, she like messaged us. She was like, Hey, can we stay one more night? And she was like, I'll just pay you cash. And I was like, (laughs) sure. So she gave us like, you know, 60 bucks cash. And I'll never forget that. Like we went out to dinner with it. We were like, this is it, you know, (laughs) like it's a sign we need to do real estate. But, um, yeah. But so after that second, like primary residence, we purchased two more, just, um, one with a, you know, 30% down payment, but the house was only worth $50,000. It was a fixer upper. Gotcha. Um, and then the second one, we used a 10% down like second home loan. So mm-hmm. we purchased a house, a beach property. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a loan program where you can purchase it as a second home and you only have to put 10% down payment. There are some stipulations where you can't like turn around and, turn that into a long-term rental, but there, you just have to technically stay in that property for two weeks out of each year. And then other than that, we, we rented on Airbnb too. Wow. Is that a North Carolina thing or like where, where does that, I've never heard of that. It's like, uh, yeah, no, most lenders will, will do it. It's nationwide to my knowledge. Um, And yeah, I mean, they're government backed loans. So yeah, they're pretty, pretty common. Good to know. Good to know. I'll to, yeah. yeah. I'll put that in my notes. So I remember that <laughs> for the next, next purchase. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so you're kind of like you, you spent these two years starting to kind of get your feet wet with, with feet wet with real estate, trying to figure that out. Um, and from what I understand, you, you didn't actually cut the tie like, totally separated mm. from, from the military. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can see I'm a pretty like conservative person when it yeah. comes to these decisions. <laughs> like I've always had this entrepreneurial itch and Christina's the same way, but you know, we got two kids now. Like I, I didn't want to, you know, totally cut ties with the military. Mm. So I ended up transitioning to the reserves for, yeah, for almost two years uh, before I got out entirely. But yeah, I did the reserve thing. 
Gotcha. So t- talk about that a little bit because, you know, you said IMA before. Uh, talk mm-hmm. about what the IMA is and like what was the obligation that you had along with that? Yeah. So IMA stands, it's IMA. It stands for Individual Mobilization Augmentee. So it's similar to the Select Marine Corps Reserves in that it's it's not like the active reserves where you're working full time, but it's kind of a mix between the two because the IMA basically is an augment for, you know, fleet Marine force units that just need a little extra help. So there's major units in the Marine Corps that have positions for, you know, reservists and it's way more flexible than, you know, the select Marine Corps reserve. So it's not, you know, one weekend a month, two weeks out of the summer. It's basically like choose your own adventure. Big picture. You have to hit a certain amount of days every year. You only get funding for those days, but it's kind of on you in that unit to schedule and coordinate the times where you work. So it's a really great opportunity. Um, I kind of thought it was like too good to be true just because when you're active duty, like you don't really care or know much about that whole side, but Mm -hmm. it's a great resource and a great program for, you know, transitioning veterans. Yeah. I, I mean, when I did it, I'm like, this is probably the biggest loophole I've ever ever found in the Marine Corps. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, it's unreal. I I know when I did it, I was, I was still my IRR window. For you, I mean, if you went to nine years, did you re-sign to do that? Or did you sign on for additional like semi-obligatory service? It was the the second one. So yeah, a little bit of additional service. Gotcha. So and did you re-sign into the IRR or did you have to re-sign into like the select reserves where you were obligated to actually fulfill satisfactory years for a certain number of years it was into the irr um so yeah when i decided to get out i mean i wasn't you know i didn't have any you know obligation or anything yeah yeah um yeah and i think that i didn't know that either that at this point ever since trump kind of passed that thing where you could go on base and like use the facilities and use the commissary Mm -hmm. there's not as much of a reason to just re-sign into the RR, but I knew guys that like re-signed into the RR just to keep using the gym base and then like, yeah. <laughs> like or the base gym rather. Yeah. Uh, and so like not many people realize that you can just like stay in the IRR yeah. for that free gym membership and hope that world war three doesn't pop off. But... <laughs> exactly. I was like jokes on them when, you know, yeah, we go to war and they get, they get the phone call, but <laughs> it could be a big gamble for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but after knowing, like what the IMO was like and the, that freedom and flexibility that it offered. Why did you, I mean, guys that I know that find the IMO, they hold on for like dear life, you know? <laughs> so I'm mm-hmm. curious why you ultimately decided to just like cut ties totally. Yeah. And, and it was a, you know, it was a decision we didn't take lightly, but the, the IMA unit that I was a part of, I had to travel a little ways to, to get there and to drill. And, you know, after working full time in real estate for almost two years, you know, I got my team and myself to a level where I felt like I didn't, this sounds wrong, but I, where I didn't need to stay into the yeah. stay in the reserves. Um, cause I'll just be honest, man. One of the main reasons I did was just for the benefits. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I love this country. I love serving the country. Um, and you know, people might say like, Oh, you didn't, you know, you gotta have your heart in it. But at the <laughs> end of the day, like, I'll be honest with you, like it yeah. was really for the benefits mostly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just, yeah, I got to a point where, you know, we talked about it and I was, yeah. we were comfortable with me just cutting ties completely. And it doesn't mean I couldn't, you know, go back if, you know, yeah. my business fails and everything, <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, I decided yeah. it just wasn't, you know, one, my heart wasn't in it. So it, it felt really mm. heavy to go mm. and yeah, work yeah. and put the uniform on. And so that kind of like bothered me, but, yeah. um, I could push through that, but it was, yeah. <laughs> I think that's something that's like 
maybe not spoken about enough is that, I mean, I think we all join, I think uh, it's safe to say like the vast majority of people join uh, with like an emotional response to it, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. you know, they're, it's like patriotism, like they want to fight, they want to, you know, serve their country and their community. Very rarely in my experience, do people stay in for the same emotional reason? You know, it, mm-hmm. at that point, it is like, it's a career, it's a job, it's benefits. Like, yeah, it sucks sometimes, but it, it, I like it more than it sucks kind of thing. And so I feel like staying in and continuing as a career um, is just kind of like, it's like the same choice as continuing anything as a career. It's like, do I like this enough to keep doing it? Yes or no? Like, all right, sure, let's let's do it. Um, and so, you know, I think everybody has their own, own thoughts on it, but it, it, it almost, the people that, like, I think you you did more service to the military by getting out when you realized your heart wasn't in it than mm-hmm. staying in despite you kind of like being over it, you know? But yeah, that's a really wise thing you said. And I, I agree. I think you put it really well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think yeah, at a certain point, the kind of luster of, yeah. you know, the service, it, you know, I mean, it's always cool and there's so much tradition and it, it's mm-hmm. great, but some, it wears off over time. And, sure. um, yeah, unfortunately there, in my opinion, there are a lot of people who are just, just stay in just to get that 20 and yeah. uh, get that pension and, you know, aren't yeah. really about it, you know, but yeah. Yeah. And which, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother topic of like mm-hmm. the, the, the damage that, that does can do has done uh yeah is, is significant so um you know no shame no shame and calling it quits when you find it appropriate for yourself at all yeah absolutely yeah um during your you know nine years total um what would you say was your favorite program or opportunity that you were able to take advantage of i think um probably it would have to be just getting to go to a couple of different schools. So I was just very lucky to get a couple billets in my unit where I got to go to a few different schools. Um, the first one being, it was summer mountain leaders course in Bridgeport, California. Uh, so it's in the mountains in California. It's basically like a mountain warfare school, um, but how to like lead a unit through, you know, mountain warfare. And, it was this awesome course, man, where we got to, we learned how to climb. I've never done rock climbing before, mm-hmm. but had a blast with that. Uh, we got to go like climb a 14,000 foot mountain. Wow. Um, it was just a great experience. I had, you know, I wasn't excited to go to it because I didn't <laughs> really realize like what the opportunity was going to be, but it turned out to be amazing. And then, yeah, I got to go to another school, um, just, that taught us how to like fast rope and rappel out of mm. helicopters. And that was, that was a pretty fun time too. Mm. But yeah, those were probably my favorite like opportunities that I had while I was in. Cool. Cool. How about for longevity wise, as far as like preparing yourself for the transition, preparing yourself for the future? Um, I mean, like, you know, you, you were on the officer side, so you already had your degree that you took advantage of. <clears throat> um, but as far as like, you know, ensuring a, a, a certain level of success after that transition, anything for that? Yeah, I think so. I would, you know, and it's something I'm trying to do with my real estate yeah. team now is like find veterans that are getting out because I just love the work ethic. Like mm. we just, like veterans just bring it in a way that's just different than, you know, the rest of society. Mm. And it doesn't matter what job you're in, what you did in the military. Um, but you're just instilled with these disciplines where, you know, you learn how to, you know, solve problems and think critically and, you know, stand up for what's right. And of course there's, you know, the 10% of military members who just don't care and, you know, are not good. And, but for the majority, you know, I, I know I felt super confident transitioning into the civilian world, um, because I just knew that I had been working on honing these kind of intangible skills over the past seven years. And, you know, 
I didn't, I'm obviously not doing like the same tactical things that I did <laughs> as an infantry officer, yeah. but yeah. like those, those leadership and the problem solving skills transition so well to this, mm. to any, you know, job in the civilian world. And yeah, it's funny, like in this area that I'm at now, I'm in real estate. I work with, you know, a lot of investors and there's a buddy of mine who, um, he owns like a contracting company and he was a recon Marine and mm. got out and, he basically only hires, you know, former Marines just because he's like, yeah, they take pride in their work. They show up on time. Mm. Like they work hard. They actually care. Yeah. And, you know, they like being a part of a team. So, yeah. um, yeah, I guess that was a long answer to your question, but yeah, I, I know personally, I felt pretty confident that I could, you know, make it in the, yeah. in the civilian world just because of, you know, these experiences that I was forced into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, I think that the, on the way in to the Marine Corps, like the recruiters kind of sell you on the intangibles a bit, you know? Um, but on, on the way out, I feel like a lot of people like might forget about them. They might just mm -hmm. like kind of think about like, okay, like, uh, where, or how much money do I have? You know, my GI bill benefits, like they focus on like the, you know, the, the tangible ones. Um, and so I think that like always remembering like, all right, what are the intangibles that I've learned while i was in mm. and that i can always like rely on always you know recall back to to actually like, put those into practice and put those into effect uh while it might look a little bit different on the outside maybe a little bit less cussing or something like that yeah um, <laughs> you know th there are they're always you know there and you you know there's something that you actually learned and practice for four years so yeah i totally totally agree with that um what is what's your i mean i know you spoke Spoke on it a little bit, but as you're building a team for your real estate business, like what is your business? Is it a real estate brokerage where you're, you know, selling, buying? I mean, what, what are you doing for your business? Yeah. So we're a team of agents that help people okay. buy, sell, and invest in real estate. So, um, yeah, totally on the sales side. Um, it's a sales job, uh, but we have, you know, a team of agents. And then administrative support to help, you know, the agents leverage their time. Mm. Um, but yeah, buying and selling real estate is what we do. Awesome. Awesome. So like kind of basically similar to five pillars, but in a different location. Is that kind of correct? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Shelby cool. Osborne and Mike yeah. Glassby, they, you know, I, I owe so much to them. They're, they're great people and they've helped me so much just kind of get started. I got connected with them, you know, right when I was like about to EAS and they were, big, they were working on starting, they realized like what they had and what they had built was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. And so they, we're starting this consulting side of their business hmm. where they were basically going to train agents how to do what they do and build a team of investor friendly real estate agents, but they hadn't done it yet. And their whole thing, like they learn best by doing like most of us, yeah. you know, so I just was fortunate enough to connect with them at the right time where, you know, they were basically offered to, have me be like the guinea pig for their consulting program wow. Wow. as long as I would provide them like honest and straight up feedback from these classes and stuff. So yeah, that was what a how, deal. yeah, they really <laughs> gave me like a, you know, a kickstart into this industry. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm excited for that. So, I mean, at, at this point you're just planning on uh, expanding and scaling your, your real estate business. Yeah, we're, you know, we're growing our team actively. We have um, two new agents that just joined us. And then, yeah, that's the plan for yeah the foreseeable future. And then oh. yeah, on the side, you know, I'm, my wife and I are continuing to invest in real estate and yeah, but ultimately, you know, work towards a, a place where we can achieve some sort of time freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just kind of, you know, we don't want to work till we're 65, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. Awesome. How do you, how do you plan on managing balancing, you know, if your wife's still active duty and, and now you're building a business in one location and obviously there's a mobile component to the active duty mm -hmm. forces, like how does that work out? Yeah. So it really will, you know, there's a lot up in the air, whether, 
you know, we're kind of leaning towards having my wife get out in the next year or two. Mm-hmm. If someone from, I don't know if she's broken the news yet to people. So if someone from her unit watches this podcast, that would be a hilarious <laughs> way for them to find out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're pretty sure that, you know, we're either going to stay here in North Carolina or mm-hmm. she's going to, you know, get out of active duty. Um, but yeah, there was a little bit of uncertainty with her career. And so, you know, that's another reason why I decided to stay in the reserves is because we weren't 100% sure we were going to stay here in North Carolina. Mm, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 most people at this point have suggested the same thing. It's like, it's pretty difficult to run a business in a location while a spouse is active duty. So like, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of got to like commit to one or the other. <laughs> yeah. It seems yeah like, I don't know if there's a good way to do both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely tough. I mean, we, yeah, she's, she's amazing, man. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me and such a strong woman. So supportive. We have yeah. two, two little kids awesome. and you know, the way that she can work full time and then come home and, mm you know, be an awesome mom and an awesome wife. It's, it's amazing. So, you know, I definitely wouldn't be doing this without her. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. We, she's, she's super interested in real estate too. So, you know, we're thinking she'll, you know, work somewhat in the real estate business too, when she gets out. Mm, Awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Sean, I appreciate you coming on. I kind of want to like wrap it up with uh, a couple last closing questions um one is do you have like do you regret joining the military in the first place i don't think i've thought about that no i I definitely (laughs) don't regret it um you know i'm very thankful for the opportunities they provided the friendships i've made Uh, i mean there's like sucky times for sure but um no i I definitely don't regret it would with that would you uh would you recommend it to somebody else Yes. As long as that person is, you know, the type of person who values hard work and, you know, working towards something and putting in the effort, you know, we have, I don't know, our, our society is, you know, there's a lot of people who might, or who are, you know, entitled or think that things should just be handed to them. Mm. You know, those people should definitely not join the military. (laughs) Um, There's enough of those in the military already. Mm. Um, so I think if, if, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons, absolutely. But if you're just doing it for, you know, and think that it's going to be easier that you're going to be able to get whatever you want, then that's not the case. That's not the point, you know, of the military. So Mm. Definitely agree with that. Definitely agree with that. What is your one piece of advice for somebody that's joined the military today? I didn't prep for that one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I would say that, you know, just everything is earned. It's not given. So the, you know, and the skills that you can develop in the military. And I said, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but they can really set you up for so much success, whether you stay in for a whole career or decide to get out. And, you know, if you can take advantage of the opportunities, the, you know, leadership opportunities, the responsibilities, um, different courses, like if you work hard and like show up and bring your A game, um, you know, it's going to, go well for you because you're going to set yourself apart and you're going to be able to take advantage of some of the cooler opportunities that the military provides. So yeah, that's what I would recommend, but just come into the mindset that you need to earn it. Mm, Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate so much you coming on and share your story. I don't know if you had uh, parting wisdom or any last things you wanted to share before we, we wrap it up, but it's been awesome. Yeah, man. No, nothing. Just, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool opportunities for transitioning service members too. So, you know, most people, unfortunately don't think about it until they're like in, you know, TRS and they're a month out or something, but, you know, you know, I encourage your listeners who are still active duty to, you know, look at, you know, what opportunities are out there. It also helps if you, you know, are a good performer because people are going to let you take advantage of those opportunities, but things like skill bridge for the Marine Corps, you know, the reserve things like 
I think I would just encourage people to look into those programs because they can really ease the transition, mm-hmm. um, which, like you said earlier, is is really hard on a lot of people. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Awesome, Sean. Well, thank you so much. Where can the listeners find out more about you if they want to connect with you? Yeah, so the best place would probably be Instagram. You can find me at sean.d.mcdonald um, or my team's website is quietwatersrealtygroup.com. Awesome. I'll make sure both those are linked in the description if anybody wants to connect. Thanks cool. so much, Sean. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to watching your business grow and connecting with you again in the future. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. Absolutely. I really hope you guys enjoyed that episode with Sean. Great guy, great attitude. And uh, it's been awesome to hear his story and kind of see like firsthand. I love seeing these successful transitions. Uh, everybody does it a little bit differently. And so it, it it's really cool to kind of like give those stories out to you guys. And hopefully, you know, this, hopefully some of you are getting excited and hearing about these stories and transitions and really just imitate the same thing they did. If that's what you're interested in, just copy them, give them a call, reach out to them, send them a DM and say, Hey, I want to do exactly what you did. They'll be more than happy to walk you through their step-by-step. And so uh, don't miss out on the opportunity to reach out to Sean. If you have any questions for him before we go, if you guys have not subscribed to the podcast on your podcast platforms or the YouTube channel, I'd really appreciate it. And if you've been listening for a while now, don't forget to leave a review, an honest review, whatever you want, one star, five star, whatever you want, just one honest review. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in and I will see you guys next week. Peace.